Hi, everybody. Welcome to Attendance Bias. I am Brian Weinstein, your host. Today, my guest is David Lutz, a professor at Dartmouth University and a friend of mine. For today's show, Dave chose July 18th, 1999, which was the second day of the Camp Oswego Festival. Today's show is part one of a two-part show. When Dave and I started talking, it became clear that we both had so much to say about the music and the festival in general that I decided it had to be split into two parts. Today's show goes into some of Dave's background and his history with Fish, the festival in general, and set one. Part two will cover sets two and three of the show. So make sure to load up the car, get your best camping chair ready, and turn on your air conditioning for Oswego Day 2. Dave, thank you for coming to Attendance Bias. How are you doing today? <laughs> I am so great. <laughs> I'm so excited to talk about this. Me too. You picked a show today that I knew, sort of, that I had on tape and then on CD, but I never had it completely. So this was the first time I was able to listen to day two of Oswego front to back. And with some of the gems that are in here, I cannot thank you enough for <laughs> selecting this show. Hey, I mean, that, that was a tough question. I mean, it took me probably like four days to get back to you. <laughs> just, <laughs> just, just pick one. And uh, I think because I was there and, you know, it was, it was something that I remember that was important in my life and, so I thought, you know, that would probably be a good, a good choice. I mean, I was a little worried that because it was three sets, we'd have so much to talk about. <laughs> when I was listening to it, I swear one of my first thoughts was we might have to do a two-part show <laughs> yes. because I had so much to say and I was barely through the first set. It was just about the festival, but we'll yeah. get there because I have a lot to ask you about that festival. Yeah. Because I wasn't able to go, as we'll get to it. But before we step into Oswego, Fish, 1999, anything like that, I just want to hear a little bit about you. Where, where did you grow up? Where are you coming to us from? Well, I grew up in the Wilmington, Delaware, kind of southern Chester County, Pennsylvania area. Um, and uh, at the time of the show, that's where I you know, was in high school. Um, I was 17. And yeah, so kind of, you know, kind of middle Atlantic kind of a kid. And where are you living now? Where are you coming to us? Uh, I'm actually, I'm coming to you from uh, Norwich, Vermont. I, I'm actually, yeah, I'm a professor at Dartmouth College and, and that's in Hanover, New Hampshire. And it's right on the border between the two states. And I used to live in Hanover and we just we moved over to, to Norwich. So I'm, in, I'm a Vermont, you know, license plate and everything now, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty funny because I think, at the time of this show, there is no way I would have ever, you know, thought that that was happening, you know, or would happen. Just complete sh sets of chances. Anyway, yeah, up here, although I got to say, it was 91 here today. And it was perfect because it got me, it's not normally that hot up here, and it got me in the mood to what it was like to be on the tarmac that day because it was so hot at this, at this, on this day. From everything I've heard about Oswego, from anyone who's been there, 91 degrees sounds like it may as well have been <laughs> Antarctica compared to what it was like there. Yeah, exactly. uh, but but uh, before we get to the heat of Oswego, in between Wilmington, Delaware, and Norwich, Vermont, where did fish come in? Yeah, it came in pretty early. I mean, you know, at Oswego, I was 17. Um, and so being on the East coast, you know, having, having tapes and CDs and stuff come through, my brother is older than me. He's three years older. So, you know, I feel like a lot of people our age might've had older brothers or cousins or something who had been around or been at colleges or heard their music come through the radio, um, or alternative rock stations or something and, and pass it down to us. We were a little younger, right? I, I I remember hearing it from you know uh, friends, older sisters who would have a tape, and and I I remember when my brother got hoist and he was playing it to me, and of course I was whatever twelve or thirteen or something, and and I eventually kind of made my way into into hearing about them enough to somehow get a copy of you know Hunta and 
and I think I was probably in about eighth grade or ninth grade and had pl- started playing the drums like, mm-hmm. like you and, um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, listening to the drumming on that album was something that I remember thinking, this is, this is much different from the other kinds of straight ahead things that were being played at the time, the mid nineties, you know, Dave Grohl or, you know, and, you know, just kind of straight ahead rock drummers. It was a little different. And that, it, it, just a little bit of that jazz training that Fish had, I had not been exposed to any fusion stuff. I mean, that might as well have been on another planet. So, is that what you that. is that what you were into? Like that, like Foo Fighters or Straight Ahead Rock in the mid nineties? Do you remember? Yeah. I mean, I was a pretty standard suburban white kid in the mid nineties. I mean, alternative rock, I guess. I mean, I, you know, my parents had all their records with you know, classic rock and the Rolling Stones and the Beatles and everything like that. And then, you know, by that point, you know, I, I started to listen to that and then, you know, then alternative rock. And then, you know, right when Fish came in was right. I listened to Rage Against the Machine and I don't, I don't know what it was that they were probably, you know, they were in the spectrum of rock to me. So it seemed approachable. You know, I had never really thought about listening to something like Miles Davis or Zapper. Yeah, or that it took was me just, years before I got to that. Yeah, I mean, way, way different. So, so they, you know, Fish had some approachable songs, right? So at that time, um, it was enough that I could kind of digest it. I think I, I, I was at least, you know, able to hear kind of some of the things that they were doing. And you know, obviously not all the things, as we'll talk about on the show, I, could I really understand what was happening at the time, but... I mean, Fish, when you talk about accessibility to a new fan or a younger fan, it's my opinion that Hoist is the most accessible album. I think that if you, if people always ask, you know, if I'm trying to get a friend into Fish or what do you suggest I play for this girl I just met? You know, yeah. <laughs> they, they, I always hear that question or see it online at least. I would always suggest Hoist. I feel like that Julius opener is a good draw down with disease is like so punctual in that with it's so well produced Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's really not until you get to riker's mailbox that you ask what the hell is going on here (laughs) you know but like just throw that in there just yeah just even even axola is like if you're into heavy rock it's there for you so i could definitely see hoist and junta being these kind of like flip sides of the band's most accessible stuff kind of the other side of the coin their most extreme magnified version of their personalities in Junta, like all yeah. the game hench stuff and divided sky and 17 yeah. minute jazz rock. It's, it's kind of like both sides of the extremes of what you're getting. It was, it was, you know, and those were a little, those were separate. I mean, I think I, I remember my brother having the, the hoist tape and, and listening to that. So I knew who they were. And then I think I had an earworm actually where someone had given me the Junta tape and we had listened to it. And I was in the school band at the time. I remember going and listening to this tape with this guy. And, and he's actually, I think he's a professional musician now. But um, anyway, he, you know, we listened to Union Federal. Oh, you know, it's got geez. the squeaky trumpet on there. Yeah, right? of course. Yeah. And there's probably two minutes of that song that makes sense or can be digested. And something about that earworm, I remember hearing, and I don't know what it was. And I, I remember being like, God, that was really catchy. And, you know, and then somehow borrowing the tape from somebody else. And that, you know, when I actually like sought it out myself was the beginning, you know, I, I had heard it, but it was always kind of given to me. And then here was this thing where I was like, well, I'm going to go find this. And I, I, you know, I didn't have a driver's license. So I couldn't even go buy it really. Um, I had to go like ask somebody for it. And then, so that, you know, the Hunter thing, I always thought of like as, so it was like this thing. And then I heard that. And so my grounding actually was coming at that album first, which is uh-huh. unusual because I feel like a lot of people would go the the cleaner produced things. And there are some clean produced, I mean, songs that like Golgi, right? I mean, that yeah. is clean and fee and, um, they're still weird, but yeah. But fee is like it's like a perfect four and a, I think it's about four and a half minutes. Yeah. It's that's an earworm. You want to talk about yeah. catchy and like Fisher Price, my first favorite fish songs. Fee, yeah. I feel like fits that to a T. It's so digestible 
almost like his kids' music because it's out of yeah. Weasel and all the funny rhymes and everything. Yeah, yeah and the cartoons on the tape cover. Yeah, exactly. I was thinking the same thing. After you got into Fish, when really digesting Junto was kind of, if I understood it, how you felt more ownership over it. If Is that fair to say? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then fast forward however many years, you mentioned it was like the mid-90s. Now we're in the late 90s. Now Fish, it's 1999. They pretty much own their world by now. They are, they could do pretty much whatever they want. And I remember this happening. I was 16 years old at this time and I was still in the part of my life where I did not have a car. I obviously lived at home. Uh, I, my whole world consisted of either where I could walk or get a ride. So when they announced their summer tour, there was nothing really available to me. I was living on Long Island with Mm -hmm. my parents at the time. And even when they announced Oswego, which even though I looked at it, it said, Oh, New York, it, it wasn't going to happen. I spent my summers working at a summer camp uh, for kids with diabetes. So as I'm diabetic, so any summer tour show was kind of out of it. But when we look at it, it was interesting that Fish announced Us We Go after Big Cypress, mm-hmm. right? Big Cypress was the, obviously the big year end festival that people talk about in such revered tones. But they announced a huge festival, but then they announced another festival after it, and Oswego was first. So when, how did you decide to go? Where, how did this come together for you? Because it seems like it was, I don't know if hasty is the right word, but it seems like it was almost an afterthought. No, I, I remember hearing, hearing about Cyprus and thinking about it, but not even having that be a reality. That... I hadn't quite, I don't think I had convinced anybody or my, I guess at the time my parents to even think about Big Cypress, right? That was, and I did end up going, right? And I, I okay. went and I was in the front row for that whole thing, which is, which would have been my choice had it not been the fact that it would have essentially made this a 20 yeah. year long podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but uh, anyway, um, you know, I, I actually, I was also at a camp. I, I had gone, um, you know, it was the summer before I was going to college and my parents wanted me to go and take some classes. And so, um, to see what it was like, get some experience, you know, living on my own and mm-hmm. laundry and just, you know, the whole thing. And I went to the university of Michigan for probably like four weeks in June. And, uh, I remember seeing the tour come through because, you know, they had played, they, they were going to play PNC and then they were going to play Homedale and, or, uh, sorry, and Camden. And I, I was like, oh, crap. Well, you know, I can't make those because I'll be at this thing. And I, I don't know what, how I convinced my folks to do this, okay? But <laughs> somehow I was obviously, I mean, because I was, I, I mean, I had like 30 tapes. I was just, there was, everybody knew that that was what I was really into. And Yeah, same. Um, uh, so we, th- I knew I had to get back from University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, basically to Philadelphia and it just so happened that it would coalesce you know where if I was leaving that camp they would you know I, they'd have to drive me so we would drive right through there I was basically kind of like look can we you know arrange this so that when we come back through you guys just stay in Syracuse for a couple of days be tourists or whatever and then I want to go to this thing and I wanted to bring my two high, my two high school buddies one of which you had seen a show with me and um and somehow convinced their parents to bring them up. So it was the three of us and we were going to go camp out. And I mean, I, you know, being essentially minors, they were pretty cool to let us go do something like that. Yeah. Um, You know, it's funny that you said that because when I've thought back to my first show, I was 15 years old. (laughs) And now that I'm in my late thirties, I'm thinking, I don't have any children, but if I did, I'm like, I would never let my 15 year old go to a fish show by himself or with a friend. It's absurd, you know? So just you telling me that you got to go to a festival at this age, you know, that's just as mind blowing in my opinion. To be fair, you know, we were really good. You know, we, we didn't, you know, do a lot of drugs. We did not drink. Um, We were pretty, I won't say we were like completely straight laced, but we, we weren't wild. So, yeah. you know, the show ended, we didn't, 
go run around all, you know, and do all sorts of crazy shit. We, we basically went back to the tent and tried to figure out what we just saw. Yeah. We were also seeing some crazy people and things from new places of the country and cultural stuff. And I mean, it was a, it was an experience. I want to get into it a little bit deeper, the festival itself. Just a few facts that I looked up about Us We Go. Uh, It took place over July 17th and 18th, 1999, at the Us We Go County Airport in Volney, New York, which uh, if you're looking at a map of New York, Syracuse go about, I would say, what, an hour and a half to two hours north of it, kind of on that lake. It's right on Lake Ontario. Yeah, it's right on Lake Ontario. Uh, The festival was announced after Big Cypress, even though it was played almost six months before it, which would never happen today, I feel. This is what I thought was kind of interesting. It took place in July, in the middle of summer tour, whereas every previous festival took place in August at the end of the summer tour. So this was like something new, something different. It was the first fish festival not to take place in Limestone, Maine. Mm -hmm. Uh, One of the most notable aspects of Camp Oswego was the heat, Uh, not speaking from personal experience, but you will, uh, (laughs) that everyone I bring up Oswego to, the heat is one of the first things that they bring up. And I found out doing some research that there were no trees at all in the campsites or on the runway, meaning there's no shade anywhere. Um, There was a side stage that featured artists such as The Slip, uh, the Del McCurry Band, Sun Seals, And this encouraged multiple sit-ins with the band Mm -hmm. over the weekend, one of which we'll talk about today, which I had never heard before. A running theme of the weekend, which I was so charmed by, I loved it so much, was the idea that the crowd and fish would break the world record for a large group doing a synchronized dance, the meat stick, to kind of either combat or challenge the Macarena, which was everything to everybody at this time. So those were just some quick facts about Oswego. Uh, But that being said, I would say overall, and tell me your thoughts on this with Oswego, I feel that it has that reputation of almost being the quote-unquote forgotten festival. Why do you think that is? Because the music is superlative. Having gone to other festivals, it was definitely a little less so. I mean, I think they had all of their their usual things um, that they folded in and, you know, costumes and, and, you know, other bands coming and you know, the Ferris wheel and mm-hmm. they have the whole general setup, I, I think, but in my memory now, and I can't remember, but it seemed a little toned down and, and like, I just don't remember quite all the extras um, that were at some other places. And I, I suspect that's, and I, if, and I can't remember where I, I read this brand, but it, I definitely think I remember reading this somewhere where they they kind of thought of doing it somewhat after the fact, like, what the hell, let's do it. We, we've we been doing this for three years now, and we kind of have to do it. And they were kind of, they thought about Cyprus, but then my guess now that I think about it is that they, they didn't know if they were going to pull off Cyprus because there were rumors that they were going to try to do it in Hawaii. And yeah. so they well, were like, well, what the hell, let's do that. And then it got, got a lot more than they asked for. And so it wasn't the crowds, you know, I, I, I don't remember and everything I can ever dig up. And it's actually, you're right. It's hard to find a lot of material about this. There's right. No photos. Um, I was doing some research. I found this great video on YouTube. I think the poster was named the great Boognish. I knew it was a ween fan mm-hmm. and it's about 24 minutes and it's like a mini documentary oh, yeah. on That's Oswego. Cool. And when I say documentary, it's really just film foot, camera footage, but yeah. it really does give a very good sense of what it was like. It's, it's all handheld camera and it's this guy and his friend, I, I imagine, on their way in, they catch all the different signs, you know, the big orange caution signs is like, have your tickets ready, fish festival, this way, <laughs> things like that. Um, the big marshmallows that I thought yeah. were from the Great Went, I guess they might have been revived at uh, us we go yeah they have the grass teepees things like that and it really you know i spent a lot of this week listening to the show in preparation for today but seeing that video yeah kind of completed it it made it much more visceral and tangible to me and i i think that probably because it was mid-tour a lot of people might have skipped it a lot of people might have ended before that because that you know 
really to go from there. And I think they went to Toronto or whatever, and probably people went up the East coast ended in Camden and then just called it. Right. Cause let's see, I think that, I think it was the 16th or whatever. I mean, they went literally, I guess, I don't think there was even a day break between, you know, Oswego and, and the night before. Right. I think it, they were 15 and 16 or something. Like, yeah. And they up. played almost every single day in July in yeah. 1999. I think they had a couple of days off, but no more than four. Like they, their touring schedule, if you look back, at Fish in 1999, their touring schedule was absurd. I actually wrote down here. So Fish played 64 shows in 1999, broken down as a summer tour that took up virtually the whole month of July. They played four shows in Japan, a fall tour, a winter tour, and then Big Cypress. Yeah, that's a lot. That's gigantic. I, I think it wore them down. I mean, I think the two festivals... Because they played on the 16th, you know, if I was, you know, if I was doing it, you know, driving, because it was, you know, Syracuse, you know, it's like from Philadelphia, it's got to be eight hours. I mean, could you it's imagine? It's probably like, more. It's probably, because yeah. from Long Island to Buffalo is about seven and a half hours. Doing that after the 16th and then, you know, then going the next day and then fighting for a festival. I mean, I, I got to imagine people just ended it and. You know, that was yeah. it. And then it went on through the Midwest. And and I, I do think, you know, you're right. I think the, the coverage there, I feel like the other events, they were end of the end of the time. And there was this celebration. It was like, well, they're reaching the finish line. Here's the end. Everybody kind of landed. And this was mid tour. And I, I think because they had done it a few years in a row, people kind of, it had happened. You know, it was kind of a thing that they had done and it was you know, hadn't pushed any boundaries. And so I don't think they got the coverage from MTV like they did for Clifford Ball. I think it wasn't, we're the biggest city in Maine anymore. You know, they can't say right. that in your state. I, yeah, certainly not. It, it was a little different. There were still, I think the estimate, at least on Wikipedia, was about sixty to 65,000 people mm-hmm. attended, which is not nothing. It's certainly yeah. a huge festival. But, you know, it kind of does fall between the cracks when you talk about fish festivals. I think in large part because of 1999, you think Big Cypress, and then there's everything else. But musically speaking, there were a huge group of new songs also in 1999, uh, including Sand, First Tube, What's the Use, uh, Back on the Train, Bug, Gotta (laughs) Jaboo, Jennifer Dances, let's not forget. (laughs) Uh, But also Mountains of the Mist. You know, there were... It was a big year for fish. You know, it was right before the end of 1.0, but maybe you're right. Maybe this was like the, the hint of the first flare up, like the last before they burned out. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of those songs are Trey songs. So yes. Trey was in May. He was playing with his own band, you know, kind of for the first time. And probably there was this confluence of all this stuff happening. And, and uh, yeah, I, you know, it, it, it's funny now because like the heat, I think the heat and the reason people bring up the heat is it, 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 it was kind of a metaphor for at least, you know, when I listen back to all the shows from this tour of it, it being pretty sludgy, you know, sounding, you know, heavy. Yeah. Um, it, it, it definitely feels, I wouldn't say tired really, because there's lots of examples of jams in here that are very fast paced and energetic. Right. But some of the other things it, it feels like it's worn a little bit, right? And I, I got to imagine that these guys have been cranking for 10 years of 100, 200 shows a year. And now they're going to, you know, all these things, they just, they're, they're, they're pretty spent. And, you know, I, I think at this thing, it was, uh, yeah, it's an unusual time. It's just a funny, funny happened to be a festival at this one particular time in this one particular tour. Um, to be at of course that was oblivious i was oblivious to it because right right you're just there for the show yeah it's different in retrospect now but you know to think about it but at the time it was kind of like but this is the first time i've ever been to one of these things so we'll see what it's like and about fish in 1999 you said you know you said the word i think you said sludgy right even though that wasn't exactly what you i understand what you meant i listened to for another one of these recordings on attendance bias, we listened with uh, my friend Tom to 
a show a week before this, um, yeah. which was, I think, July 9th, 1999 at Merriweather Post. Okay. And again, there, that they, they were very sharp. They were very heavy rocking. And, but there were starting to be signs to indicate that they were kind of drifting from the center in their jams. And mm -hmm. that Trey was very eager to use his layers, uh, his, yeah. his guitar pedal layering effects. Uh, there was a Mike song at that show that did that. And I also heard that a number of times in Oswego where yeah. they just played so much music that, you know, when it wasn't a focused rock and roll jam that I'm kind of used to with fish with psychedelic improv rock, it kind of became this like, all right, where are we going now? This to be very cheesy journey to outer space. You mm -hmm. know, and I thought that came through in a number of jams here. So yeah. well, let's get into it. Let's get cool. into the show itself. So for us, we go, we're talking about day two, which was July 18th, 1999, three sets today. Right. So like any <laughs> festival, it started, would you guess around like four o'clock in the afternoon and went to about, I don't know, midnight, I would guess. Yeah. You know, I guess, I guess so. And if I, if I remember correctly, and this, this may or may not be right. I feel like the third additional set was added on, you know, it was going to be a two and two. Oh, and they, and they added the third one and someone's going to be able to fact check me on that. Cause I've never seen that, but I swear I must, I remember that being in, in, in the recesses of my mind that they added that third set on there. So you, you're thinking whether accurate or not, you're thinking that there was announced to have a two set show and then they threw in the third one. That's what I remember. Well, I'm glad they did because the third set for the <laughs> show is unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but the whole show, the whole day starts off with Punch You in the Eye into Farmhouse, which was a very typical late 90s version, beautiful, easygoing. And then Water in the Sky, which I thought was fun because just a few months later, they would be in Big Cypress and we're so mm -hmm. used to the cheer now after Filter Out the Everglades. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen then. <laughs> What do you remember about the opening of this show, if anything? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the day before we had, we had tried to get up in the front and I think we made it to the second or third row and couldn't get on the rail and we had no idea what we were doing, but we wanted to get pretty close to see. And um, I, one thing, it was very hot there, but the first night, what they did was they, they may, they wouldn't allow you to put your caps on your on water balls and bring in mm. open water. You had to have an open water thing. And I'm, you know, we've been to venues where that's been the case. Sure. I don't know why, but, but not something you do when it's 90 degrees. And so we basically retreated. So this day, Sunday, you know, I got up there and I was probably there at about 9, 30, 10, right at the start, you know, with a horse and the guy and there's photos of that. And, and we put a whole big thing of water bottles in our backpacks and sprayed it up to the front, got right on there. I split off from where my two buddies were and I was kind of on my own right in front of Trey and um, they had all our water. Um, and I, you know, there I was and first time seeing this and then, you know, in the, and you can hear off the monitors, right? So it's a different sound. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was there. I mean, it's as close as you can get, you can see everything, you can hear it. And so, you know, there were no videos. There were no, right. That was the only time you could ever know what that was like. And it was kind of like being in this new world. And the opening was, you know, God, I wrote all these notes about it. It's kind of embarrassing, <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, you know, had that slow, you know, slowish punch and all these things, you know, the things I'm going to relate are things like what it was like at the time to see something for the first time that now everybody knows about. Right. But, Seeing for the first time, having it all together, like the dancing or, um, you know, I don't know, little, little bits and pieces about, okay, well, here's Water in the Sky. And the only time I had that, heard that was on a tape from our run, you know, the first run in 97, it was slow. Right. It was now kind of the country Western version. Now it's fast. And every time a sh song's coming, A, it's also probably one of the few first times I'd heard it. So right. I'm trying to process this and also this new view of the band and, where I was. And so I was pretty in a, I was in a good place. I mean, I, I it was, it was pretty hot, but I felt like we kind of, we beat it. Uh, yeah. So after that was bathtub gin, which I was very impressed with yeah. when I heard it, you know, there was like an immediate groove. The song part is like four and a half or five minutes long. And then like immediately 
there's this theme that would become common over the rest of the tour where they just kind of lock in on an immediate melody. And within like a few minutes, they're starting to raise the dynamics. 1999 was a great time for Fish to control their dynamics. And Bathtub Gin is an excellent example of that where Trey's playing triplets and the energy is just building and building while the band all locks in behind him. Fishman kind of changes the tempo here and there, and it just builds like crazy until it ends as the usual bathtub gin ending. And I just thought it was a really notable version. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about the show was because that, that, this song, uh, this version of the song was the first time I had been seeing them where they had really gone pretty far away um, and come Mm -hmm. back over a pretty long period of time. And I can't, it's like 18 minutes or something. Yeah. But I don't think any of the songs, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess in the, our first show, it they did that a little bit, but not, I wouldn't consider those, you know, the very same kind of a thing as what they're doing with this, where they're building. And it's a, it is a rumbling up. You can feel the layers and it's getting heavier and then Trey's on top and um, they're finding that, you know, that strong groove and, whirling through it and uh it is pretty beautiful it's very there's a lot of hose um yep. and the thing i remember most about it i i think it just sticks out in my mind is i remember them kind of coming down they kind of went back up a little bit with the kind of fast you know gin theme and then they kind of slowed back down again before he talks about the guests coming and i remember kind of just like jolting awake you know <laughs> like well, i had been in this kind of a you know a musical days and right they taken you yeah, I was in a, yeah. I had, you know, clearly been, you know, like in flow basically, or, sure. you know, and, um, and that was really weird because I, you know, I never had that. I didn't, I hadn't even, you know, hadn't even taken drugs or smoked pot or anything. It was just, I was there listening to it. And that was a weird experience for me. Yeah. And it's the most pure thing there is. It was, it was really cool. And I really liked that, that feeling. And, and it was, yeah, I mean, I, I, when I, I, of course, I listened to it a zillion times to the point where I can hum along to all the changes and mm-hmm. stuff, you know, and mm-hmm. um, in, in the grand scheme of things, I mean, it's not the craziest jam of all time or anything, but by any means, it's, it's nice, you know, it's, it's really pretty and it's, it's worth listening to, I think, but, um, you know, I think just the way it played out in my life uh, was the one time where I remember and this wasn't even like the peak best jam I've ever heard, but the first time where I felt what that feeling is like. And uh, yeah, it, it's, I, it was a, it was a really a special thing, you know, and anyway. Right. No, you mentioned also before Trey introduces the guests, you're talking about the Del McCurry band for the next four songs. Fish has the whole Del McCurry band on and I have to tell you, this was really such a treat for me because I was listening Mm. to this show for the first time in preparation (laughs) for this, uh, driving back and forth to my parents' place. They live about 45 minutes away from me. And back on the train, they played back on the train, If You Need a Fool, I'm Blue, I'm I'm Blue, I'm Lonesome. And what's the last one I have? Beauty of My Dreams. And Beauty of My Dreams, yes, that's right. So back on the train, which was new at that time, it had only been around for, I think, just a couple weeks for Fish, at least. Mm -hmm. Um, Fewer than two minutes into the recording, I already thought, is this the best version of Back (laughs) on the Train I've ever heard? I really felt that way. You know, it it made me wish for more bluegrass sit-ins.
If You Need a Fool is beautiful because Del McCurry kind of became more prominent in If You Need a Fool. It's like they were the front band and Fish were the guests. On Blue on Lonesome, they kind of switched back and forth. And mm-hmm. Beauty in My Dreams, I love how Trey introduces it as the way it should be played. Yeah. You know, as if Fish is just doing some sort of half-assed imitation. This stuff really spoke to my soul. I love these bluegrass sit-in, sit-ins. It was unusual, I mean, at the time, and I, I don't know if it's anything like your experience, but my my knowledge of bluegrass was pretty minimal. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think bluegrass was where I grew up and, you know, probably in high school was the coolest thing ever. Uh, I mean, you know, the revival of folk and bluegrass. It, oh, kinda, brother, where art thou also yeah, had a lot it, to do with it. It, it, it. Yeah, it hadn't quite reached... Uh, at least where I was coming from at the time. So I didn't really, I mean, I knew that they would play bluegrass songs and I had heard some of these on tapes and stuff, but I had no idea who Del McCurry was. I, I didn't know, you know, any of this stuff. So seeing him come in was kind of an unusual experience. It was pretty great because actually, you know, I started to, and I think this happens with a lot of people who watch this band, you know, there, there are a lot of influences and you'll go pick up their record or go pick something else up and, see like at the side stage right you were hearing the music for the first time and pre-internet that was kind of how you did it you know you you got some exposure somehow and i a couple little fun things about this was that yeah i feel like and i've seen a lot of fish shows but i trey kind of let him and he's got a pretty strong stage presence right Del mccurry has been around yes. a long time so yeah. trey definitely deferred to him in the second second song there and he was kind of, you know, he let him kind of run the, run the roost, which you don't often see in a fish show. You, you'll normally see him, you know, when Sun Seals the night before, he kind of had him come on and then they're like, okay, we're done. We're going to play some outro yeah. music so that you can walk off <laughs> and get off our stage. Right. And we've seen that fairly recently when they had uh, Kenny Rogers at Bonnaroo or yeah. Bruce Springsteen at another Bonnaroo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because they don't have a lot of guest stars, but you're right. Usually they're guesting with Fish. In this sense, at least to my ears, it's it sounded more like a collaboration, not yeah. quite a guest sit-in. At the time, I had no idea. Um, I couldn't appreciate it. And um, But now that I think about it, I'm glad it was like that rather than somebody I knew. Mm-hmm. You no, know, I think if it had been a band I knew or something I, you know, a cover I knew, cover, things I knew more about, I... I probably wouldn't have explored as much. So yeah, it's it's true. You know, it's when it hits you from the side, it hits you sideways. You're kind of more interested to find out what happened. It's yeah, Fish is a gateway band. Yeah, totally. You know how many other either bands or artists or entire genres that you could say it's possible you never would have researched if not for Fish. Mm-hmm. I could easily say that Bluegrass. I don't think I would have discovered it on my own. Yeah. Had had I not heard Poor Heart, you know, yeah. on, on a picture of Nectar, for example. I agree. And I, I, I think that something that is really hard to explain to, you know, one of my, my little cousins or something, you know, Spotify, man, all these, you can just, and I'm not trying to be, you know, curmudgeonly old man here, but it is quite easy to access different types and styles of music. And in that, in the somewhat, you know, early vestiges of the internet, word of mouth, hearing other things, seeing other you know lots of bands stuck to their you know their style and type and being a multi-genre band was pretty unusual yeah that at the time you know that was very different and um and i think it made a lot of the people our age who listened to them you know at that time start to really listen to a lot more music absolutely so after the sit-in there's the mama dance during which Trey announce he announces the uh, the attempt for the greatest the biggest group dance and the fans do boo the Macarena. <laughs> yeah, which is, uh, the mama dance was extremely slow compared yeah. to what we're used to today. After that came Reba and Chalk Does Torture, yeah. and with Reba it just sounded so soft. The jam does it starts as it always does, very soft, but almost to the point where. Paige uses a keyboard. I don't know if you caught this. It almost sounded like cocktail hour music, yeah. but it begins to soar. 
It really does. Like Reba definitely does. And to me, this is probably in my head. I did not check the stats, but Reba says festival daytime show to me. It's a very yeah. cool down song. Um, it's very peaceful. You know, I always glance around my surroundings when they play it. And it just, I, I felt like I was there. It was very yeah. calm when I, even when I was listening to it through my headphones. And Chalk to Torture was very long. It was, I think, something like 12 minutes or yeah. so. Um, it was very schizophrenic, like Summer 99 tended to be. And around six minutes and 40 seconds, it leaves type one in melody it, it was still really fast and it was still pretty crazy but it did take a nice leap yeah you know i remember them playing chalk dust and i remember and and it's funny now but at the time and something i can't get out of my mind is that here's trey playing and he's you know he, he was looking in the distance and he's playing and he's trying to find it and he's trying to find the groove or whatever and he and i distinctly remember him being really frustrated at, at chalk dust and it's probably i don't remember when obviously but Sometime in when they leave type one and he's trying to build it and he's trying to sync up with everybody else and he wants to, you know, match up and it kind of crystallizes a little bit, but it doesn't soar really. And then they kind of just, you know, they kind of wrap it up and it, it, they, they hit the landing, right? It's a good. Oh, ending. Absolutely. It's great. But, but I remember him kind of, I don't know if he was swearing or what. And now that I think about it and I, and having heard him talk about, you know, the, um, you know, the E center chalk dust and, and how they kind of just took that off, you know, it just kind of explo exploded. I, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, they were trying, he was trying to guide them that way again and, and he just couldn't do it. And, yeah. and they weren't synced up or whatever. And, and what's so funny about that too, is that like, it's a really good version. I mean, it, it is really spectacular and it's, you know, that was only what, you know, seven days or eight days after that, thing happened which is totally a, a, a miracle song version yeah. right um and so this is yeah i think this would have been notable because it would have been very different they moved outside the box on that and um and then hit the landing on it and uh it you know it's a long that was a long set i mean it, it was like an hour it fit on a long tape that's what i remember yeah it's they're all long sets uh yeah. this show has like three sets that are i think the the shortest one is like an hour and 20 minutes all it's the whole show together is four hours and 40 minutes yeah that's tremendous was, that's that's a gigantic set of music yeah i i think that i remember the moment dance i thought you know and then reba hap i thought that would end it and then there's a chalk dust and the reba's slow and everything's drawn out i mean the moment in there you it, you know is is what I remember thinking about when I think about it being sludgy, you know, it's very slow. It's almost like running in humidity. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it is like, that's, that must be, if you were to do beats per minute, that moment is very slow. But that works because we were at the end of the first set anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. And there you have it. Part one of our two part conversation of Camp Oswego Day 2. And like I said in the beginning of this conversation, I had heard parts of this show before, but I never listened to the, to the whole thing at once. And I have to recommend this to anybody who considers himself or herself a fish fan because it's got it all. It's got incredible jams, including 
what I think is probably the best Piper I've ever heard. Uh, an amazing bathtub gin. It's got game henge and banter and great new songs and guest sit-ins. It's got it all. So if you've never taken the time to listen to Us We Go front to back, or if you've never listened to Day 2 front to back, uh, this was a real discovery for me, a real treat. And I've been listening to this band for, who knows, 27 or 28 years. So um, highly recommended to anybody. And there were a few times in today's conversation where Dave and I got a little confused and were unsure about certain facts, so it's now time for our fact check. First off, when we were talking about Fish's summer tour, especially the month of July, I said that Fish had, quote, no more than four days off in July 1999, but I was wrong about that. They had seven days off. They played 19 shows in 26 days, and out of those 26 days and 19 shows, they only had seven days off in 26 days, which is not what we expect today. Uh, They did play the night before the Oswego Festival. They played at the PNC Bank Arts Center in Homedale, New Jersey. In that same part of the conversation, Dave and I guessed that driving from Philadelphia to Oswego would be seven or eight hours, but we were both wrong, and we were both wrong by a lot. According to Google Maps, it's only four hours and 37 minutes by car from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania to Oswego County Airport in Volney, New York. So not a tremendously challenging drive. And finally, Dave suggested that Fish was originally scheduled to just play two sets each day but added the third set on day two as sort of a bonus or an unplanned surprise. But according to an article on MTV.com that was dated March 11th, 1999, Fish was scheduled not only to play two sets, but they were originally scheduled to just play one day at Oswego. The article reads, quote, While previous Fish summer festivals have lasted two days, Frank Hale, the director of Oswego Chamber of Commerce, said that the band is currently scheduled to play July 17th only, but, he said, a second show could be added the next day, and as we all know, it obviously was. And that's it for part one of our conversation about day two of Camp Oswego. Please tune in for part two when it becomes available. I'd like to thank Dave Lutz for joining us today fish.in for providing a solid audience recording of the show fish.net for everything they do all the time and of course i'd like to thank you for listening attendance bias is available wherever you get your podcasts you can also find attendance bias on facebook thank you again for listening see you next time